Hello and welcome to the FMCC webinar, BIM and FM, How Building Information Modeling is Transforming Facility Management in Asia and Around the World, presented by Michael Schley. I'm FMCC liaison, Joshua Amos. Next slide, please. I do want to welcome everyone to this webinar. We will be, everyone is muted for audio quality. And if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to ask them through the chat box. And this webinar is being recorded. Next slide, please. Thank you. I do want to let everyone know that the FMCC offers many options for their consultants, benefits to their consultants. It says we have Ask the Expert, Find a Consultant, Locate a Speaker, and Online Educational Resources. Next slide. And again, at any time during this webinar, you do have a question, feel free and ask them during the question box, and we will go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. There will also be two polls that we will go through during this webinar as well. And I remind you that there's always a survey at the end of the webinar that I encourage you to take. The board does a yearly look at those results and the feedback to improve the experience for you. Next slide, please. And always, we want to thank our sponsors of the FMCC. Next slide. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ricardo. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon for everybody that will join us today for this important webinar. Uh, that uh, I'm uh, Ricardo Carpaldi. I am I am located in Brazil, São Paulo, Brazil. I'm a uh, uh, Western manager for Americas, Africa, and Europe webinars. Now, 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 the, now the presentation today will be uh, will be seen in FM, how building information modeling is transforming facility management in Asia and around the world. The presenters are is Marco Schule, the Salis Dental, CEO of FM Systems. Next, please. Okay, uh, Ricardo, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, good, e good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are. I'm uh, pleased to join you today. Uh, my name is Mike Schley. I am the CEO and founder of FM Systems. Uh, our company, FM Systems, develops uh, what used to be called CAFM software. These days we uh, prefer the term Integrated Workplace Management Software, or IWMS. Um, we are uh, pleased that we are also uh, preferred industry partners with Autodesk for BIM and FM. Uh, we're based in the U.S. but have customers around the world. Uh, our learning objectives today are to uh, better understand what BIM can do for facility management, uh, understand a bit more about how we make that happen through BIM deliverables, learn a bit from people who have been early adapters, uh, and understand a bit more about how the technology integrates. I'm going to start off uh, with a few definitions uh, to define what is BIM, and we'll see that it is not quite as clearly understood or defined as we might like. Then talk about why we care. Uh, what does BIM do for the various participants in the building design, construction, and operation process? What it means to the FM profession and what some of the issues and challenges are. Uh, a global perspective, what is happening in some interesting places around the world with BIM. And then a couple of case studies, of, or three case studies actually, of organizations who uh, got in early and we can learn from uh, what they learned. So BIM, what is it? There is a short definition and a longer definition, and both are, are true. The short definition is, is software and technology that allows us to define buildings in 3D and with object intelligence. Uh, and object intelligence is that there are properties or attributes based on the things we're drawing. Instead of drawing with lines and arcs and circles, we're drawing with objects. And those objects know what they are, and they know how to relate to other objects. A simple example is you have a wall and you decide to put a door in, and the wall automatically adapts itself with the door frame, etc. Uh, examples of BIM that meets this definition, and I call these authoring tools, would be the Autodesk Revit product, uh, the Bentley Systems product, uh, the Graphisoft product, uh, and there are a few others. But they're uh, a fairly small number of authoring tools. It's also 
good, I think, to um, embrace the larger definition of BIM, the long version. And the, the definition I liked best was coined and developed by a construction company in Minneapolis called um, M.A. Mortensen. And this is uh, referenced in uh, this book that I would recommend. It is the best book, uh, general book on BIM I know of, the BIM Handbook, uh, edited by Chuck Eastman and Paul Teicholz. Uh, and according to Mortensen, um, BIM is digital, which, which means it's more than just scan drawings. It's vector definition. It's spatial, meaning it's 3D and you have an, a representation of what is happening in buildings in 3D. It is measurable, meaning you can quantify it, you can dimension it, and it is queryable. I don't know that queryable is a word, but it ought to be. And I think we are there. Uh, the tools we use do these things. The next three things are works in progress, and we're on a journey, and we are not to the end of that journey yet. Uh, in Mortensen's mind, or definition, it should be comprehensive, meaning everything having to do with the design, operations, and ultimately demolition and decommissioning of a building uh, is encompassed in BIM. In Morton's definition, it's accessible that anybody who plays a role in the building has access to it. Uh, and finally, it's durable that the BIM model travels with the building throughout its life. We are working on these things, and companies like mine and others are, are leading the way, but we have more, more ground to cover, uh, and it'll be some time before we achieve all of these things. Now, we've talked about what BIM is. Let's talk a bit about what it is not. Systems that relate to BIM uh, and are uh, common users and consumers of information for BIM or maybe providers of information to BIM, but are more usefully understood as distinct systems. So starting on the, uh, the top left, uh, building automation systems, and uh, that has recently been uh, invigorated by the IoT or Internet of Things movement. A lot of interesting things happening in this space. Uh, we've been dealing with smart buildings for 20 or 30 years, but suddenly they're not only smart, but they, uh, they talk to each other through the internet. Um, so this is definitely a space to watch, and it is a consumer of information from BIM. But the people working in this space are different than the people work developing the authoring tools. So I, uh, in my view, it's more usefully understood as a related system. Uh, similarly, at the bottom left, uh, GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, uh, systems like the Esri Arc Info system. Similar, uh, they also are modeling and tracking physical reality, uh, but they worry about different things. They worry about topography and ground cover and, uh, and uh, utility lines. So although there's some um, overlap in uh, capabilities, BIM is really optimized for buildings, GIS for outside buildings, and it is most useful, again, to look at these as distinct but related systems. Moving into our world of building operations and facility management, uh, at the top we have CMMS, or facility maintenance. Um, these systems, uh, familiar to, I think, most of us, are the bread and butter, the day-to-day -day working systems uh, to keep buildings operating. And they are big consumers of big BIM data. But BIM does not make a very good CMMS system, and CMMS was never designed to totally model buildings. So they are best, again, understood as distinct but related. And finally, at the bottom right, uh, the area where um, I'm involved in, which is IWMS. Um, IWMS takes the building information adds information like leases, occupancy, people, organization. Uh, something that BIM really can't do, uh, but IWMS systems shouldn't be in the business of trying to design buildings. So the, uh, the key to understanding is to understand the relationship and who um, logically should look after what. The, um, let's next go to benefits of BIM. Why do we care? What's in it for the various parties? Why is it worth the effort of learning and utilizing this new technology? We saw BIM start about eight or nine years ago, and uh, Revit had really come uh, to the fore. It was the uh, replacing AutoCAD in a major way. And we started hearing from our um, 
colleagues who are architects, uh, when are you going to support BIM? And uh, our answer at that time, well, when people ask for it, when our customers ask for it. And uh, what we thought they might do is wait until their customers asked for it, but in fact, that did not happen. What we saw happen in the uh, uh, 2000s was most large architectural and engineering firms moving from CAD to BIM. And they did this not because anybody was paying them to do it. They did it for their own reasons. Uh, what they found is that was better framework for what they did, better framework for information, for looking at energy analysis and sustainability, uh, for visualizing uh, and explaining what the building was to their clients, and really a better way of drawing. Um, CAD, although it was much better than paper, was a far cry from um, perfection. And uh, they found that BIM could really do a better job of coordinating everything you needed to get a building designed and built than CAD did. So that, that battle's pretty much been fought and won. The interesting part is to see how contractors have embraced this. And to be sure, it's the more major contractors. But if we think about what a general contractor does, the general contractor is in the business of coordinating, coordinating, synchronizing, um, and managing complicated problems of space and time. Um, to make sure that none of the subcontractors run into each other, none of the design work is a, a conflict, uh, and to make sure that, uh, particularly on crowded urban sites, that staging happens in an efficient manner. So BIM is great if that's your problem, and we saw most, we've seen most of the major contractors embrace BIM as a tool to do the, uh, the project, the task construction more efficiently. So that it's all well and good, but is that the end of the story? And I and others think not. Um, we believe there are benefits for facility managers, and we're beginning to see these benefits. The big, biggest benefit, and the most obvious one, uh, is integration with maintenance management. Because a well-ordered BIM process during construction is going to produce a lot of information. It's, in fact, essential to get the building done, to understand down to an equipment level by manufacturer, uh, model number, etc., what is in that building. That is the same information that is needed to manage that, uh, that building systems. So uh, if we can get a fast handoff or sharing of information between the information known by the BIM model and the information needed, in the facility maintenance system, we've got to win. So we're seeing people do that, and uh, we're seeing a, a lot faster start time for maintenance systems than the traditional six months to a year that it would take to really get everything categorized, organized, etc. I think there's more potential in this, though. My vision is that where we end up is using BIM as the electronic owner's manual. Um, Today, we have a pretty archaic way of knowing what's in our building. Uh, we've moved a half a step be beyond the picture here of three ring binders, but only half a step. Uh, today's method is you get a bunch of CDs and they have PDF files on them. Not a lot more useful than the three ring binders. Ten years from now, when a truck runs into the uh, side of your building and you have to figure out who made that window wall system, um, you're going to have an archaeology project to figure out uh, who the original supplier and models were of that. Uh, if that information is easily accessible in a rich um, BIM model, it can have big benefits. Uh, and a BIM model that is kept up to date, that remains a live system. So I think this is the potential. We are, for the most part, not there yet, but we will be and we can be. A second thing that BIM can do for us is provide a launching pad for building performance analysis, looking at different ways we might design our building or retrofit our building, uh, and what it might, uh, what impact it might have on building performance and energy usage, whether it's replacing out window wall systems, upgrading mechanical system, replacing our lighting. Um, Tools work with BIM that can analyze all of those things and give us a better estimate of the pros and cons, uh, the cost and the benefits of doing those things. A 
a uh, more subtle benefit, but I think quite significant, is using BIM as our system of record. Um, people used to do this. People used to have drafting shops that they would keep uh, up-to-date records of buildings. Um, and ironically, when CAD came in, we sort of lost that discipline. So today we have piles of CAD files, but if you actually want to know where the pipes run or where the ducts run, uh, it may be a lot harder than it has to be. So I think BIM has the potential to um, get us back to that discipline and have the BIM model be the authoritative record of uh, source of record for what the building is. If we can achieve that, we can achieve some major downstream savings because every time the building is remodeled, we're requiring contractors to guess. Um, and we have a, a little out language in the contracts that to, to be verified by contractor. Every time a contractor sees that language, they add a, a safety factor because they can't be sure what's in, in those ceilings and behind those walls. Uh, if we can take some of that risk out of the process, we can save ourselves money. And finally, the big goal is better life cycle management. Having a better forecast of what we need to be doing to that building uh, into its future in order to keep it in good operating condition in a cost-effective manner. And BIM provides a great uh, source of information and platform for doing that. Um, as we know, uh, although ironically it's never been uh, very well substantiated, most of the cost of a building happened after construction. It's generally agreed that that's between 80 and 90 percent of the, uh, the cost of the building. And that's leaving out bogus things like occupancy. You don't get to count salaries for that. But just keeping the building operating costs a lot of money. Better at keeping it improved and up to date costs a lot of money. BIM can help us with that. But like with uh, any new opportunity, there are issues and there are challenges. Uh, something everybody wants to know is what's happening with facility managers and building operators and the use of BIM. And uh, it's a very moving target. Uh, and if we ask the question um, a year from now, we will have a different answer than today. But the best information out there that I'm aware of is uh, published by McGraw-Hill. Uh, they have published a series of uh, reports called the Smart Market Reports. And if you uh, just Google Smart Market Re Report McGraw-Hill, you'll find them. They're all free for downloading. And they published this one two years ago on the value, the business value of BIM for owners. Now, uh, I will uh, express a little bit of amusement that the uh, view of people outside facility management of uh, what we do is purely from an owner point of view. I think most of us realize that um, it's more uh, interesting and complicated than that, that the people who own the building may be different than the people who occupy the building and may be different than the entity of the people who operate the building. And all three entities have an interest in the building. So rather than just look at owners, I think it's more useful to look at owners, occupants, and operators uh, instead of 103Os. Uh, nevertheless, this is what McGraw-Hill found, and there's bad news and good news. Uh, the bad news is as of 2014, uh, only about a third of building owners reported using BIM. If you had the 14% of high capability, the 18% of moderate, uh, coming up with 32%, about a third. And two-thirds were not. However, if you look at what people believe is going to happen within five years, it flips. And uh, it's believed by the people surveyed that by 2019, three-fourths of the uh, building owner community will be using BIM, and only a fourth won't be. So I believe this tells us that there's a general belief that this is the future. This is where we are going. Let's talk about the technology aspects. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, it is most useful, in my view, to look at uh, BIM tools as being distinct from the facility management tools. Uh, I also said that there's value in uh, sharing that information. So the question is, how do we do that technically? There are three approaches that are being used, and they all are working depending on what systems you use. Um, the simplest is a file transport. 
and there is a standard for that that I will be talking about in a few minutes called COBE. Um, and it's a matter of exporting from the BIM system and importing into your maintenance or IWMS system. And it, it does a pretty good job, um, and it's compatible with most systems. Um, systems just have to support the import and the export. Uh, there are some issues with it though, and the biggest issue is the people on the BIM side don't know what valid data is on the target side. So they may enter in an equipment type um, in a lookup list, and when it gets over on the maintenance side, that lookup type is not a valid value. So it requires people on the receiving side to do some data scrubbing and data validation. Um, and that's somewhat painful and can diminish the value of this method of sharing information. A second method is uh, software that we call middleware. And it sits in the middle between and reads and displays information from the BIM model and also provides information and maybe to some extent reads it back from the maintenance and the IWMS systems. Um, it, to the extent that they're supporting different systems, it's valuable. It gives us an easier to use system for doing that. Again, there are data validation challenges, um, and those vendors are required to keep up with everybody's newest version in order to stay compatible. So uh, that tends to limit uh, their ability to serve a, a broader market. But it is a way to go, and we have seen success with that. Uh, the final method is direct integration, and this is the method I favor. Uh, we decided to, uh, to go this route when we started our BIM journey about five or six years ago. Um, it's possible to do real-time updating, and you get bi-directional information so that when you're uh, identifying information in the BIM model, you can make sure that it's valid over on the IDFMS side. Um, the limitation is not everybody supports every system. Uh, we only support one BIM, BIM system ourselves, for example, which is Revit. Uh, if you're users of Bentley systems, uh, we will apologize, but we're not able to help you. So there are some, uh, some issues there, but uh, we find it, it provides a, a smooth uh, connection and a, enables the BIM model to stay alive after construction. If you want to go that route, you need to um, understand the concept, well, in any of these, the idea of authoritative source. So when you're integrating facility management systems, um, a good understanding, and this is where the consultant community plays a big role, I believe, uh, is to understand who controls what. Uh, in my view, logically, the BIM model controls physical reality, the building structure, windows, walls, doors, mechanical systems, etc. The And I'm using a generic label facility management system, which could be maintenance, could be CAFM, could be IWMS. Those systems control the other things, things like real estate, leases, who the occupants are, moves, work orders, service agreements, repair history, etc. Now, there's not always a black and white distinction, so sometimes a judgment call needs to be made. Um, but if you let uh, use the guidance of if it's physical reality, it's BIM, if it's operational, it's not. Uh, that paves the way for a good understanding of authoritative source. Where we're heading with this, and we're starting to see it now, uh, is interoperability. Um, so the ability to smoothly integrate in a functional uh, aspect the two systems. Uh, this is some work we did with Autodesk that integrated their 3D model viewer called the A360 model viewer with our system. And it allows you to uh, operate uh, and to point to something in 3D on a BIM model and then it brings it up uh, and calls up additional information <coughs> from the IWMS system. So for example, if you wanted to um, re replace out a, a, a VAV box in a mechanical system, uh, you could see both the repair history and the service calls related to that branch of the, uh, the mechanical system, and also see that in 3D so that you could understand what parts of the building were going to be affected when you were down for the repair. And that starts giving us more useful information than we've had in the past. Um, we haven't really been able to embrace the full effect of how building systems interact with occupancy before now. But I think integrating BIM with our um, 
facility management systems, we start getting some value there. One of the hot areas in computing these days is cloud-based computing. Uh, and more and more systems are going to be cloud-based. There's a particular advantage of moving our BIM systems and our facility management systems to be cloud-based. And to be clear, the actual BIM authoring tools are still pretty heavy and still are generally more desktop and network-based, but it doesn't keep us from sharing the models uh, over the internet and putting our IWMS systems uh, in the cloud. The benefit here is that a lot of different parties need to have access to that data and by using cloud-based systems that's facilitated uh, and it enables a um, facility manager to uh, contract for the BIM services uh, with a company that specializes in that. Most uh, corporations are choosing not to uh, develop that in-house but intend to uh, source it out uh, to people who make a living doing BIM and that makes a lot of sense. The cloud makes it more feasible. Another hot area in technology is mobile. Um, so putting BIM information available to everybody, first of all starting with the web browser which is not necessarily mobile but it's how we all access almost everything these days uh, and then putting it in mobile devices either through apps or uh, through uh, mobile applications uh, to do things like uh, be able to process work orders uh, on a phone or a tablet uh, or to be able to look at uh, construction changes on a tablet. The, um, so the technology is working today. Um, there is a full capability in most major systems to move information from BIM models over to the CMMS, IWMS, or CAFM systems. Now the issue. What to what information do we need and how do we ask for it? Uh, imagine having a, a banquet with a very large banquet table and hundreds of food choices and you can have anything you want. Uh, if you have everything, uh, you will feel quite ill at the end of the evening. That's our situation today with BIM. The BIM models know so much, they know more than we are capable of managing on an ongoing basis. Um, furthermore, so what's needed is to be more specific, to focus on the information we really need and are willing to maintain and willing to assure its accuracy and to come up with a way of asking for that so that when a building construction project is completed we get useful information rather than a dump truck loading a ton of information on us um, which is more than we can handle. Uh, some of the best work that's being done on this is the COBE standard. COBE stands for Construction Operations Building Equipment Information Exchange. Uh, it is part of the U.S. National BIM standard, but it is referenced by Building Smart International. And uh, if you uh, dig a little bit, you'll find that um, a lot of the BIM standards worldwide reference back to the COBE standard. Uh, when you uh, download the uh, slides, if you wish to do that, I've put in the useful links. This one is uh, nationalbimstandard.org. will get you to the COBE standard. And um, the first version of COBE was interesting, but not that useful. It just provided a framework for information. And by the way, there's a misconception that COBE is handled in spreadsheets. Uh, it can be, but more properly, it's, um, what it is providing is a framework for information. And uh, there is an alternative method of transferring called Kobe Lite, uh, which is a bit ironically named, but it provides a um, XML format for Kobe information, which is, in my view, the way it should be. Uh, we hate getting information transferred by spreadsheets because you, you don't know what might happen to it on the journey. Leaving the spreadsheet aspect out of it, though, what Kobe uh, the second edition, the latest draft version, is doing is providing specific information on what should be tracked uh, for major building systems. Um, now, we uh, got together some of um, our friends and clients and formed a, a loose group called the BIM FM Consortium, and we looked at this problem. And it's find out it's not an easy problem, easy question to answer. So if the question is, what information should we track, it's a very 
um, context-dependent answer. Uh, depends on what sort of systems you have, um, how much you want to track, how much you are able to track. And people are um, all over from almost nothing to too much information. We took as an, a test example pumps, and we looked at what different standards were calling for in tracking pumps. And we came back to the COBE standard as being about right, not too much, not too little. So if you look at what they say about pumps, uh, in addition to what they ask for for any piece of, uh, of equipment, which is a current voltage frequency, they ask for flow, churn pressure, controller type. Three basic pieces of information. You could do less, you could do more. Uh, Kobe seems to hit it about right. Uh, but I will say it does not take the burden off the user to make their own judgments over that's whether that is what they need to, uh, to operate their buildings. Now, um, the question is, where do we start? And I think there are certain building types that make a lot of sense for BIM. Uh, first, and a certain uh, ownership type. So owners who occupy is a bit of the sweet spot for BIM. And this would include government agencies and entities and universities and colleges who own and operate their own buildings. So those are the logical biggest beneficiaries of BIM data. Uh, they have the long-term stake in the building so that investments made in information are going to pay off to them directly. Second, um, users of technical buildings stand to gain in a major way with BIM. Uh, so that would include laboratories, R&D facilities, uh, healthcare hospitals and uh, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, and airports airports where there's a lot happening in three-dimensional space and a lot of not just mechanical and electrical systems but also conveyance systems that make up um, a typical airport. Uh, and then finally new buildings because it is highly probable that that new building was designed in BIM and with very little extra work a BIM model can be delivered. Well that's all well and good but a lot of us work in buildings that are not new and they're not that technical. So what about that? Uh, are they out of the game or not? And we're finding some of our clients are making the decision to put their existing portfolio on BIM. Um, they're not going at it as heavily as people in a new building. Uh, they find it is worth tracking some information, but not everything. So it is um, smart to decide what is worth collecting and putting into this sort of BIM model. And I would call this a lightweight BIM model. Uh, at a minimum, your, um, your walls, your doors, your workstations, your major mechanical systems, uh, which would include the HVAC system, probably lighting, uh, probably power. Uh, most likely not plumbing. Plumbing is sort of predictable. You know where it is. It doesn't really, it, it kind of takes care of itself. So as long as you don't uh, run into a pipe, uh, plumbing is sort of a, static and benign. The key thing though is to also set up a workflow uh, and set up the discipline that when the building changes it's going to be somebody's job to keep up the BIM model. And that is true whether you're doing an older building or a new building, that workflow is critical. Because if you get two years down the road and have not done that and you've done some subdividing of your space, some putting in of new um, uh, new rooms or taking out of rooms, um, some resetting of thermostats, uh, the value of the BIM model starts eroding pretty quickly if it is not current. And after a while, people can't trust it anymore. There's also uh, some value of what I would call special purpose BIM. Uh, BIM models designed just to do some analysis. And they might be maintained afterwards, they might not. Doesn't mean they, it's not a useful tool. And then an interesting technology uh, is point clouds. Uh, point clouds work by uh, setting up a couple of lasers that, uh, that rotate and, uh, and take basically what is a three-dimensional CAT scan of our model, of our BIM building, not model, but our BIM built our real building, uh, and provide a background that we can then, um, somewhat with image recognition, create a BIM model of. Uh, it is far from perfect but does have a usefulness. 
Okay, um, we are at our first uh, participant poll, uh, and um, the question is, are any of your clients requiring BIM deliverables? Simple yes or no question. And Josh, please come in here when you uh, wish to, uh, to close the questioning. Okay, we have 60% say yes and 40% say no. Uh, okay. I will share with you that uh, compared to the uh, Eastern Region uh, webinar we did uh, the other day, um, there are about 10% uh, more using BIM than they were, although the, I wouldn't call these uh, scientifically correct samples, but uh, interesting. Okay, so here's the uh, trick follow-up question. Now that we know that the clients are requiring, uh, how many people are using them, using that information? But eleven percent say yes, and eighty-nine percent say no. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, honesty, at least. Uh, <laughs> the uh, so we uh, we all have some potential here to uh, get more BIM and to start using it better. But that's why we're all spending an hour of our our day uh, talking about this. So thank you for your response. Uh, let me take a, a broader view now and share some information about what is happening around the world with PIM. Um, I'll again reference my, uh, my friends at McGraw-Hill. Uh, they, um, this is, I think also two years ago, uh, did a study on the use of BIM for construction worldwide. Now to be clear, this one is construction, not design, not occupancy, so it's got a bit of a skew there. But it is, a, I think, an early indicator, a leading indicator of what information will become available for us on the facility management side. Uh, again, available for download. And the, uh, the graph here shows experience with BIM. And the, um, the more uh, orange, or call that tan, purple, and green, um, the more experience by geography there is. So according to the, uh, the McGraw-Hill survey, uh, North America leading, uh, followed by Japan and South Korea, then followed by Australia and New Zealand, uh, Europe, uh, UK, France, and Germany, and then uh, South America with Brazil. Now, I will say my knowledge of BIM acceptance would probably put Australia higher. Um, we've really seen on the design uh, side that design uh, and engineering community embrace BIM faster than North America have. Uh, also, as we'll get to in a minute, we're finding the UK has uh, taken a strong lead because of some government actions there. Uh, but those government actions happened pretty much since this survey was taken, so uh, that's why we see uh, the numbers we see. And doesn't mean that those who are coming to the party a little bit later can't catch up and surpass the folks who were doing it earlier. Uh, this is also interesting information, again from the same study, is a BIM mandate what governments around the world are requiring BIM. Uh, I had the pleasure to speak at an annual conference that the government of Singapore sponsors on a BIM for governments uh, about a year and a half ago, and was uh, quite impressed by how many different countries are doing different things. Uh, everybody in the, in the Asian region of the world, um, from Vietnam to Malaysia to Philippines, um, and China, of course, India, uh, are doing things. Um, the, uh, so we see in most places where a lot of construction has is happening, uh, governments are involved in setting some standards. Now depending upon um, what party is in control, we might have more or less uh, mandates and more or less funding, but at least activity. Let's highlight a few of those that are happening. And I think the, uh, the biggest player in the past few years has been the United Kingdom. Uh, starting a couple of years ago with a requirement that went into effect this year, 
that all public sector buildings in the UK must uh, have BIM deliverables. And they call this level two BIM. Um, a bit of possible confusion on the terms because there's a related term called level of detail. And this does not quite mean that. Uh, it means more a level of maturity. But essentially what it means is that buildings must be designed and constructed with BIM. There must be a BIM deliverable that has the basic geometry and the basic properties of the building defined in the BIM model. Uh, and from my perspective, on the other side of the ocean, they seem to have pulled this off nicely. Uh, we see uh, evidence of this in adoption rates. And uh, it's uh, not without bumps, I'm sure. And uh, there might be a comment somebody from uh, that part of the world wishes to make. But uh, we've seen a, a lot of attention. And I think they're, they're making it happen. Um, about two months ago, they uh, issued their strategic plan for their next step, which they're calling level three. And this moves beyond just properties and toward interoperability, and going beyond just the building toward the operation and the functioning of the building. Uh, so a very ambitious plan, uh, not as well defined, uh, but I think it will be the interesting thing to, to watch in the world. Um, from there, we move to the other part of the world. Uh, if we look at where most of the construction is happening, it is happening where we, uh, we believe it's happening, which is in China and Southeast Asia. And that is notwithstanding what's happened in the last six months in China, which is a bit of a slowdown. But uh, if one understands the basic dynamics of that country with urbanization on a scale never seen before demand, uh, we realize that they have no choice. They've got to build things in order to keep the, the country running. So even if it slows from 13% growth to 6% growth, uh, that's a pretty um, dramatic growth rate compared to the, most of the rest of our homes. So in, uh, and these are 2013 numbers. Um, the source is IHS Economics, a very respected, probably the best source there is for global economics. And in that year, they found uh, China with $1.78 trillion of construction. And I do believe that's all construction, including infrastructure. Uh, the US in second place, but with about half of that. Uh, Japan, which was interesting, but a bit of an anomaly because some of this reflects earth place, earthquake uh, reconstruction and repair after the earthquake there. And I think if you looked at it currently, it'd be a little bit slower. Uh, followed by India, mostly due to its size. Uh, then Germany, France, United Kingdom, uh, and then Brazil which um, is coming on strong with the uh, World Cup, uh, Olympics, etc. cetera. Uh, McGraw-Hill did another one of these studies uh, on China. And what's interesting on the China rate is the dramatic change over just two years in BIM use by architects and engineers, uh, architects and contractors. So going and the, uh, the bars to watch are the green, brown, and tan. Uh, and particularly the brown, which is high BIM usage, in two years growing from 14% to 26%. So what I know of China is that they are embracing technology. Uh, they're gutsy about it, ready to try anything, and building like crazy. So uh, it's, I think in many areas, China is going to lead the way because they've got the construction projects to, uh, to fund it. Now, the place that I like to watch is a lot smaller than China, uh, and that's Singapore. In 2010, Sing the Singapore government issued the um, BCA BIM roadmap. So who's BCA? B BCA is Building Construction Authority. Now, if you talk to people from Singapore, they will tell you that they have an advantage. Uh, and it's not so much that they have a strong um, majority party rule, which is not quite as majority as it used to be, but that they have one level of government. And they don't have to uh, have the inefficiencies of a, uh, a nationwide government uh, coordinating with a state government, coordinating with the city or local government. It's all one and the same in Singapore, because they only have about 8 million of uh, population in that place. So they're, they're able to do some things uh, more easily that are very difficult for um, most of the rest of us. So in 2010, they tasked their uh, agency that oversees and does, does all government building and oversees all building um, with uh, coming up with a BIM roadmap. And that BIM roadmap was a, uh, a that by 
the middle part of the decade, which was last year, 80% of all construction would use BIM, and that by the end of the current decade, they would have be they would be saving 25% on construction. Uh, they are nicely on track to do that. Um, I have not seen good reports back on the construction. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but they are definitely getting the adoption. Um, and they are requiring, as of last year, that any building 5,000 square meters or larger, and that's not a very large building, uh, use BIM for design and construction. They not only had the mandate, but they had the facilitation to enable that mandate. Uh, partly, first with education, charging BCA Academy with offering a lot of educational offerings, both for continuing education and practitioners, as well as at the college, uh, polytech, and university level uh, to teach BIM. Second, a compliance system, something co they call the e-submission system. If you want a building permit, you have to submit a BIM model. And they, uh, they set up the system that made that easy to do, but also made it assured that they could uh, require BIM of all construction. And standards, uh, coming up with design and construction standards um, to, uh, to guide what that meant. Uh, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to go a bit quickly here so that we have quite time for questions at the end. Um, we had the, um, so they've moved nicely through design and construction. Um, two years ago, they launched a pilot project that we had the uh, privilege of working on uh, to move that into FM. Uh, so the, uh, the pilot project was to create a test bed, and we worked with them to, uh, first of all, start with a Revit model, link that to a database on a web-based server, put that server in the cloud using Amazon Web Services, and then provide access uh, in a browser for space management and maintenance. Uh, part of the test and the pilot test was to make that work on mobile, so we had tools for that and we allowed them to do work orders and floor plans on mobile. But they were really set on doing one more thing, which is being able to do 3D on mobile. At the time we started the project, that was not possible, but through the work of Autodesk that was delivered two years ago, um, they then launched their 3D viewer on a mobile platform, uh, so using their cloud-based viewer are able to get a 3D model on a tablet, which is very cool uh, and has some usefulness. The more significant part of that project, though, was the requirement to write a guide. So we did that, and let me show you with you one of the salient findings of our writing, and uh, we're making this available to anybody for free download. It's at this uh, web address, which you can get off the uh, uh, the PDF that will be posted later today. And the idea that uh, BIM starts with design, and that's one type of model, it migrates to a construction model, and it picks up specific information as far as manufacturer, selected system, etc. At the end of that process, there is a valuable resource which should be saved, and we're calling that the as-built model. But the as-built model properly goes into archive because it is too heavy for day-to-day -day use. And in our view, what then is needed is a trimmer version, a leaner version that is used for ongoing work, and a version that we can assure that we are going to keep accurate and up-to-date, and we will set up workflows so that when aspects of information in that model change, we update it in the BIM model. Um, very quickly, a couple of case studies, and I will recommend to you this book also. Uh, the book is BIM for Facility Managers. Uh, it was uh, produced, and I had the, uh, the opportunity to uh, shepherd this into being by the IFMA Foundation. Uh, IFMA Foundation, uh, in conjunction with John Wiley and Sons, you can buy it from uh, IFMA or you can buy it from uh, Amazon. And in that book, we, uh, cover, we highlight six case studies. Uh, I'll quickly share two of them with you right now. The uh, first is Xavier University in uh, uh, the U.S., a relatively small college of about 7,000 students, notable because they put their entire campus on BIM. And they learned from that. Um, they learned that it's important to uh, work upstream and to set the standards during construction. Um, but their big takeaway is that they were able to justify a 10 times increase in their operations budget, in their maintenance budget, because they had the data 
to uh, assure the trustees that they knew what they were doing. So a great example of the value of good data being able to justify a proper budget. Next is MathWorks, a technical software company in the Boston area. And um, they had the benefit of a CEO who was a scientist uh, himself and really saw the, the benefit of good uh, information, uh, particularly good geometric information. So tasked uh, the facilities department to make this happen for their new headquarters. Uh, their lessons learned, uh, I'll just cite a couple of them that are important. Uh, first, that room and asset numbers matter. These are going to be used throughout construction and into operation, so it is worth some careful thinking about what they are and get general agreement so everybody involved in the process is talking about the same thing. Uh, people who are BIM savvy matter uh, down to the subcontractor level. And remember pumps a little while ago in the, the talk, and I'd looked at the three pieces of information. When they started their project, these about 10 or 12 items of information is what they thought were important. At the end of that project, they realized they were overreaching and that it would have been better to ask for half of that. And uh, we've talked to them since, and they said, well, actually, even less. Uh, so they are realizing that their ability to keep up with information uh, is a governor or a limit on what should be tracked. And that is a very good advice that lean modeling is better. Uh, if you're not sure, ask for less is my advice. So I will leave you with these two thoughts. Uh, we are tasked with managing the built environment, and we need to do a better job. We know that that is where people spend most of their lives, and we know that that is where a major part of the Earth resources go into keeping buildings operating. Uh, it's our job to do better, and we can. If we're going to do that, BIM is one of the essential technologies that we need to be using. So we have uh, five or ten minutes for, for questions. Josh, go ahead and moderate, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, again, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat box, and I will be more than happy to present them to Michael. And also, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I do want to remind everyone that if you do want a copy of this PowerPoint in your control panel under the handout section, there's a PDF copy right there for you. You can go ahead, click on that, and download it right now. So you don't have to wait for that to be mailed out. Okay, we'll give it just another moment to see if any questions come in. You may have just covered it so thoroughly, Michael, there aren't any questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm still waiting for those 80% of the people who have BIM but aren't using it, so. <laughs> right. Here's one. It says, what success have you seen integrating BIM into CAFM programs? Um, well, I have a particular view because we do that, so we have had success. Um, now, it's a, uh, it's more complicated, we found, to do that than it was for CAD, so not everybody is doing it. Also, you have to make some decisions on what you're going to track, whose responsibility that is. Um, some things are clear, uh, other things take some thinking about. Uh, but the hooks are there. Uh, the modern BIM systems facilitate that, so um, there's no reason that a developer, a software developer like us, cannot do it. Excellent. Okay. I don't really see any other questions. Um, you have Michael, oh, another one just came in. How to sell BIM and SM to investors? Key points. Um, it, it somewhat depends on who we mean by investors. Um, if the investor is the client and the client is going to um, occupy, operate, and own the building, then the selling proposition is that it uh, does a better job of managing the building over the life cycle. Uh, now some assumptions will need to be made on the cost of doing that and the potential savings and I wish like we all did that we had um, ironclad data that we could point to and I think it's all of our jobs to work on that uh, but the state of affairs right now is that we're going to have to make some reasonable assumptions. Uh, if the um, investor means just the financial investor, uh, it's going to be somewhat tougher. Uh, the selling proposition is that the uh, cost of operating the building can be less with better information. And I think that is true 
and I think you can make a credible case on that, uh, particularly if you um, envision the converse of that, trying to operate the building with no information um, requires too much guesswork, uh, too much inefficiency on the part of the company that's charged with the building operation. But like many things we do with technology, uh, it is, uh, requires a good amount of judgment to make the case. Excellent. And then they're asking, is bidirectional communication a reality yet in updates both ways? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we are doing it. Now, I'm going to qualify what we mean by that. Uh, if you remember the authoritative source, uh, BIM is the authoritative source for, for simplicity, let's say, walls and doors. So what we um, do not allow, should not allow, and does not make sense is for the IWMS system to update walls and doors. Uh, that really is owned by the BIM system. However, what we can and should do on the IWMS system is uh, update our information and share that with BIM. So that might mean a, um, a, a change in a service contract for a piece of equipment. It starts out and it's known to BIM on who has that service contract, what the warranty is, but it doesn't make sense for BIM to be the owner of that so that we're updating that on uh, the IWMS side. By bidirectional though, we're mean immediate uh, and interactive sharing of what each is the authoritative source on. So when a wall or door changes on the BIM model, we see that immediately on the IWMS side. When we change something like an occupancy on the uh, IWMS side, we can see that immediately on the BIM side. Great. I have one last question, and we're about out of time. So it says, we FMs are largely concerned with existing buildings. Is BIM pilot, excuse me, is a BIM pilot project practical to help us with feasibility when we make a larger business case? I think it is, but I would recommend going a step at a time, um, starting with maybe one major building and uh, working out the processes, the value proposition, the workflows on that before going with an entire portfolio. Uh, we are seeing some of our clients take the bold step to do all of their, uh, their portfolio on BIM. It's also somewhat easier if you have a bigger mix of new buildings and makes uh, additional sense if you have a technical building. But my main advice would be walk before you try to run. Take a step at a time. Evaluate as you go. Expect to make some mistakes. Expect to do some things which you'll later wish you had done differently. That's how we advance, and that's how we really are going to get the benefits of this. The technology is there. Our challenge is going to be developing the practices to use it efficiently. But I think where we need to head up is getting out of CAD uh, in the next three to five years and using BIM as our source of record. Excellent, Michael. You provided a lot of great information. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. I would like to let everyone know about some upcoming um, FMCC events. Um, again, Facility Fusion Canada taking place in Montreal next week. If you can make it, that would be great. And then also the next upcoming webinar that the FMCC will be hosting is Uncensored Analytics for Lower Tech Facilities. And that invite should be coming out shortly. Next slide. And as always, the FMCC does like to make everyone aware of the other councils that are out there here at IFMA and that they are great resources for these specific fields. And the final slide. And as always, I just want to thank Michael for presenting another great webinar for us. I want to thank everyone for presenting and enjoy the rest of your days. Have a great one, everyone. Bye-bye.